Thank you, Denise. That was beautiful. I'm looking forward to that day when we will meet on that beautiful shore. Amen? You know, I, as I was uh, traveling into church today, I was thinking, what am I going to miss most about this church? And it's not the parking lot, as nice as that is, or the sign. Um, of course, it'll be the people, the friends that I have. That's who I'll miss most. But about the church, what I'll miss most is the talent that we have at this church, musical talent. Um, Gayla, I really appreciated the songs this morning, and I appreciated um, all the talent that we have, the different praise groups that come up here, and it sounds so good. It's a little taste, I believe, of what it's going to be like in heaven when we gather around God's throne, and we will sing with the angels. And you know, I've appreciated, um, I've enjoyed pastoring this church. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, this church, of course, I don't have that many to compare it to uh, since I'm at the beginning end of my ministry, but I have no complaints about Urbandale. Urbandale is a great church. And today, my friends, is the last time I have the sacred privilege of speaking to you before we move to Saginaw. And I just want to say how blessed I have been to have you as our church family. Many of you will be our forever friends. Urbandale will always hold memories of the good old days. So I just want to say thank you. And also, when another pastor comes, realize that you have a part, you have an influence over them as well. You have a part in shaping who they are. And, and I have grown a lot since I've been in Urbandale. My strength has, my faith has been strengthened. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together. And uh, we thank you for your love for each one of us. And we thank you that sometimes um, change happens, and that change makes us uncomfortable. But in the long run, you have a greater plan in mind. So, Lord, we pray that you would guide and uh, that you would bless the Urbandale Church. And we, we thank you for each one of us being a part of this church and encouraging one another and lifting other up, each other up. And Lord, I pray that Urbandale will continue to be a light in this community that shines brightly until you come again. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to welcome each one of you here. I also want to welcome those who are watching on live stream. I also want to welcome the one or two of you who will be watching from Charlotte. Uh, last week, our audio did not work on the live stream, so this message will be uploaded to our website there. So if you're watching, I want to welcome you as well. If you're on vacation somewhere, if you're at home, we're glad that you have chosen to tune in. I've entitled my message today, um, Understand or Perish. Growing up on the farm, I wanted to be rich. I would look at the old trucks my dad was driving and think, oh, one day I was going to have new ones. That would bring happiness. And yes, these are real pictures of the farm I grew up on in the, in the trucks we had. Nowadays, they would be antiques, come to think of it, probably worth quite a bit. But back in those days, they were old trucks. I still remember seeing the new model F-250 Super Duty come out in 1999. And I thought, if I could ever have one of those, I would be happy. I mean, really happy. You know what? I've had three of them, and none of them brought me happiness. Because happiness doesn't come from the things you have. It comes from the joy that only God can put in your heart. And it has nothing to do with things. But as a child growing up, I would dream. In fact, I drew house plans. We didn't have coronavirus back then, but we did have flus and bugs and colds. And when we were sick, my parents would quarantine us in our room. And I, as I was quarantined in my room, I would uh, get out paper and a pencil, and I would draw house plans, house plans for a massive edifice. I still have those plans tucked away in the keepsake box. 
three stories tall, 7,200 square feet, plus an attached three-car garage that had doors at both ends so you wouldn't have to back out. So I'd have a drive through essentially, for my two Ford trucks and my Lincoln. Yep, I was going to have a Lincoln. That was, that was the car back then. For Sabbath, you know, you couldn't take those old, well, those nice farm trucks to church. Needed a suit suitable vehicle to go to church and give those large offerings because I was going to be rich. I was going to give God lots of money. I was going to sponsor major evangelistic outreaches all over the world. But God spoke to me. No, I didn't hear an audible voice. But even as a child, God spoke to me. So children, young people, teenagers, if God speaks to you, listen to what God has to say. And God spoke to me. And God said, I don't want your money. I want you. And from then on, there was born within me a desire to work for God and a desire to preach. And preach I have, and has it ever been fun? I've had the privilege of presenting hundreds of in-home Bible studies, preaching 15 separate evangelistic campaigns, and assisting with dozens of other ones, gaining new insights each time. I've also enjoyed on going on three overseas mission trips. For the last seven years, I've had the privilege of pastoring three of the best churches in the state of Michigan, making friends with some of the finest people on the planet, being a part of a fantastic, probably the world's best capital campaign, where my faith has been strengthened, witnessing, frankly, the impossible. Don't tell me that people who are in the Lord's work don't have any fun. There is no better work. Witnessing people making decisions to follow Jesus all the way in baptism, through Revelation seminars and Bible studies, there is no superior pleasure. And one day, in the earth made new, to meet these people that you have had a small part in bringing them to Jesus, there will be no higher ecstasy than that. But once again, I hear God speaking to my soul. And I want to share with you this morning and into early afternoon what is on my heart. You see, when I was deciding what to preach about today, I thought about preaching one of those great inspirational sermons. You know, those ones that just make you feel happy and joyful. But I'm not going to do that today. Today, I just want to share with you from the bottom of my heart. And I want you to realize that I desire with all of my being the kind of experience with God that I'm going to describe to you today. You see, I haven't arrived. Sometimes you'd be tempted to think that the pastor has it all together. Maybe some do, but I don't. And deep in my heart, I desire a deeper relationship with God. I want to move on to the next level, if you know what I mean. I hear God's voice speaking to me again, saying, look at your own relationship with me. As Paul says, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. God says you could spend your whole life preaching my gospel, but that's not a substitute for an intimate relationship with me. And just because you can do great Bible studies and do evangelistic meetings and, and preach a great sermon once in a while, that's not a guarantee of your salvation. In fact, it has nothing to do with it. I can speak through a donkey if I want to. So if a donkey shows up to teach you the Bible, you'll know God couldn't find a person. And dear friends, I just want you to please understand that I'm preaching to myself just as much as I'm preaching to you. But I'm not just preaching to myself. I can do that and sometimes do do that at home. I am speaking to you. And I pray that God will impress on you the desire to understand because it is understand or perish. 
there are some things in life you have to understand or you will perish. Growing up on the farm, it was dangerous. You didn't understand. You perished, quite literally, all right. I still remember my dad describing it in graphic detail. A neighbor was baling hay with those big round bales. I don't know if they use them here as much as they do up north, but a lot of times they see the square bales. But, you know, the, the round bales is what I'm talking about. And my dad described in graphic detail a neighbor was baling hay with one of those balers. The baler feed plugged, and the man got off the tractor without engaging the PTO and tried to unclog it. And he gave that swath just a little kick with his foot. But those rotating fingers that come underneath and pick up the swath snagged an item of his clothing and just sucked him on in, and he became part of the bale. Living on the farm, you had to understand the danger of those moving parts. Those who don't understand, perish. Understand or perish. What is it that you and I today need to understand? I invite you to open with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. I want to encourage you to put a bookmark there in Matthew chapter 7 because we'll be uh, coming back to this passage. In this passage we find the sobering prophecy of Jesus that in the last days, the majority will be lost even though they thought they were saved. Let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. One of Satan's greatest deceptions in the end time is described here in this passage. It's also described in God's message to the church of Laodicea. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Can you imagine a greater deception than this? To go through life thinking you were saved, believing you were saved, only to find out too late, when it's too late to do anything about it, that you're lost. But isn't that what God is describing here? Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And God says, I never knew you. Cast out demons in your name? Many, many. That is to say the majority will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That's all the pastors and teachers. Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. That's all the good church people. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. But we went to church every week. We volunteered at the Salvation Army. We helped at the soup kitchen. We fed the homeless. We even went witnessing on a couple Sabbaths. I never knew you. But Lord, we were vegan. I'm serious. We paid a double tithe. 
Depart from me. You see, friends, the gospel of popular Christianity says that if you pray a prayer and ask Jesus into your heart, you will be saved. That's it. That's all there is to it. We're told that we ought to just trust God and He'll take us through. It's the once saved, always saved doctrine. Just water down a little bit. American Christianity says it doesn't matter if there's sin in your life. As long as you prayed a prayer one time, you're good. As long as you prayed a prayer one time and you really meant it, you'll be saved. Now, we as Seventh-day Adventists don't believe this. But subtly, imperceptibly perhaps, this ideology has even crept into our minds. The idea being that we're all saved. Let's just praise Jesus. If there's sin in your life, oh, a big deal. We all have our struggles. God understands. His sacrifice on the cross has taken care of everything. By and large, we're all going in the way we are. But are we? That's the question. Now, I hate to burst your bubble, but we've got to ask the tough questions, and it's a whole lot better we ask them now while we're still able to do something about it. The Apostle Paul urges us to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Unless, of course, he isn't. Now, someone's probably going to say, don't judge me. Oh, friend, I am not here to pass judgment on anybody. I am here today judging myself, and I am asking you to do the same, to judge yourself. In this prophecy, notice what Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. Let's, let's read that again. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. The which gate? The narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and, what does it say? Difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Now that verse bothers a lot of people. Why is it that the gate is so narrow? Why is it so difficult? Why so few who find the way to eternal life? Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The reason why so few find salvation is that a relationship with Jesus is the only way. You say, oh, that's so simple. You're right. It is so simple, my friend. We are in a great danger of missing it altogether. The only way to have a relationship with God is by spending time with Him. How much time do you spend with God every day? Just take a moment. Not out loud. Just ask yourself, how much time did I spend with God this week? We could even go back as early as this morning, couldn't we? How much time do I spend with God every day? That's why the way is narrow, friend. That's why it's difficult, and that's why there are few who find it, because how many of us are really spending time with God every day? I'm not talking about reading a two-paragraph devotional from a Pacific Press book, as good as those are. I'm talking about spending time with God in the Bible, spending time with God in prayer, spending time... Getting to know God as a friend, well-known, like Enoch did. I'm talking about a walk with God like Enoch had. Some, somebody might say, well, I can't be like Enoch. Oh, no, can't be like Enoch. But why not? I want to take a detour for a moment and zoom in on the life of Enoch. Here are the facts about Enoch. Fact number one, Enoch lived in a time in earth's history that was extremely wicked. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Enoch pleased God. Hebrews 11 verse 5 says, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken he had this testimony that he what? He pleased God. 
Enoch lived in the end times. To put it simply, Enoch lived in Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 6, Noah is building the ark. In Genesis chapter 7, you have the end of the world by a flood. Enoch lived in end times. Enoch was a Seventh-day Adventist. He kept the Sabbath, and he preached about the second coming of Jesus. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. In fact, Jude tells us in verse 14 and 15, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam... Doesn't that make him a Seventh-day Adventist? Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all and to convict all who are ungodly. Enoch walked with God and was translated to heaven. Genesis 5, verse 24 tells us, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now I have a question for you. How many people in this earth's history have had that experience? They did not see death, went right to heaven without seeing death. How many people have had that experience? Two people that we know of that are recorded, right? Who are they? Enoch and Elijah. Now here's another question. Will anybody else have that experience? When Jesus comes again, there will be thousands translated to heaven without ever going through the portals of the tomb. And you can't help but wonder if the life of Enoch is a parallel of what our lives should be right before Jesus comes again. You can't help but wonder why God says, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And you can't help but wonder if this statement penned by Ellen White in 1904, toward the later end of her ministry, you can't help but wonder if this statement might also be true. Many regard Enoch as a man to whom God gave special power to live a life more holy than we can live. But the character of the man who was so holy that he was translated to heaven without seeing death is a representation of the character to be attained by those who will be translated when Christ comes in the clouds of heaven. Enoch's life was no more exemplary then may be the life of everyone who maintains a close connection with God. A close connection with God. Why does it always come back to that? A close connection with God. It's understand or perish. So simple. But if you don't get it, you'll perish. I don't know about you, but I want that close connection with God. I desire it like nothing else. But you have to more than want it. You have to more than desire it because many will be lost while hoping and wishing to be saved. You have to put forth some effort. Jesus says in Luke 13, verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow gate. What does that word strive mean? Look it up in your dictionary when you get home. It means to make great efforts to achieve or obtain something. Isn't that salvation by works? No. You are not saved by your striving. You are not saved by those efforts. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, God says that all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. That's the best we can do. What must he think of our unrighteous acts? To put it simply, you are saved by faith, not by works. Yet your faith must be shown by your works. God has given his son to die as an atonement for our sin, and we must cooperate with God's plan to save us. That is, we must believe and obey all of God's requirements. 
But don't miss the point. This is a result of maintaining a close connection with God. How do you have that close connection with God? I cannot give you a formula because if it was, it wouldn't be a relationship. Yet there are some things that are crucial to every relationship. Communication, for instance. Go to God in prayer. That is how Jesus maintained his connection with his Father. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, the record states that Jesus in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. In the morning, go to God. Pour out your heart to him and say, Lord, I'm not the person I want to be. I'm not the person you want me to be, but make me into the person you want me to be. Give me the grace to serve you today. Give me the power to obey you today. Change my heart, O oh God. Change my desires. Mold me and make me into the person you want me to be. At times, Jesus spent whole nights in prayer. I've met people who've talked to God like that. One person I know, a very godly person, in my conversation with him, it just slipped out that God regularly woke him up at 2 or 3 in the morning to spend a couple hours with him. He knew God and God knew him. People say the most important thing is to know God. That's important, but what's more important is does God know you? A lot of people claim to know God. They sing praises to Him. They talk about Him. But at the end, Jesus says, I never knew you. How do you know if you have a close connection with God? What is the acid test? Well, I invite you to come with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. How do you know if you know God? How do you know if, if, you, if you have a genuine experience? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Now notice, this isn't for you to tell if somebody else knows God. This is to tell if you know God. This isn't a, a, a measuring stick for me to judge somebody else. This is for me to measure myself. It says, now by this, this is 1 John 2, verse 3, now by this, we know that we what? Know Him. By this, we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Now it is possible to make it look like you're keeping the commandments without knowing Him. That's possible. That's legalism. That's being a hypocrite. A Pharisee. It's a terrible condition to outwardly do all the right things on the outside as a replacement for knowing God. Because your own righteousness is like filthy rags and you'll never ever get into heaven on filthy rags. But listen to me carefully. It is impossible to know Him without keeping His commandments. Look at your life. If you are doing in your life what you know is wrong, if you are violating your conscience, turning your back on things of Scripture, things you know to be right, and you're just doing these wrong things anyways, you have great reason for fear and trembling because you don't know Him. Let's go back to Jesus' uncanny prophecy of the great disappointment at the end of time. Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. How will you know if you are a genuine Christian? What are the fruits of your life? Look at your life. Look at the way you talk. Look at the way you walk. Look at the passions of your heart. Is Jesus in there somewhere or is he just something you do on Sabbath? Something you add to your life. And what is the fruit that you're bearing? Do you act like the world? Dress like the world? Experience the same joys that the world experiences? Can you love sin and relish it? Then you don't know God. 
we have ceased to realize that God is a holy God. The Bible says, 1 John 2, verse 6, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. And Peter says, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You can't be holy while you're watching things and listening to things and participating in things that are unholy. It is frighteningly possible to be an Adventist without being a Christian. We compare ourselves among ourselves and conclude that we're better than most people in our church. And that means what? It means you're being judgmental, if anything. God is a holy God. We've forgotten that. And God says, by their fruits, you will know them. When we compare ourselves among ourselves and we see others who profess to know God just as involved in enjoying the entertainment and pleasures of the world just as much as anybody else, we compare ourselves by ourselves, nothing troubles our hearts. I think one of the problems in our society and in our church is this. Our minds become confused and we look around and we tend to think that what we see with our eyes is all there is. Although we profess to believe otherwise, we live like this is the only life there is. We pursue entertainment rather than the peace of God. We pursue the American dream, and we've lost sight of the vision of heaven. We pursue the acceptance of friends and a desire to fit in instead of the approval of God and a desire to fit into His kingdom. Oh, I watch things I shouldn't watch. I laugh about the things God hates. But bless God, I'm an Adventist. I love the things of the world. I love the entertainment of the world. I love so much that's in the world, but I'm an Adventist. Do you know what your profession of Christianity is worth? Nothing. Let's read it. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I'm sure the question that's looming in your mind right now is the exact same one a man asked Jesus 2,000 years ago. Lord, are there few who are saved? Are there only going to be a few who make it? Do I have any chance? Is it even worth trying? I mean, I'm not a morally strong person. I'm what chances do I have? There is very good news, my friend. The wisest man who ever lived said, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Isn't that good news? In the New Testament, God put it this way. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. There is hope for you. There's hope for me. There is a narrow gate. There is a steep path. But praise God, there is one who says, I know who you are. I know what you're made of. I know the struggles of your heart and my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The gate is narrow, the path is steep. But come walk with me. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The Bible speaks of a narrow gate and a steep path, but praise God, the Bible also speaks of a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes and tongues and peoples standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. If, in fact, John saw that great multitude of saved, so many people he couldn't count them, why not you? Why not you? Think positive. You can be saved. Let's defy the odds. Burgess, you're going to look good in a white robe. And Gaylord, you'll look good waving a palm branch. 
we can be saved. Everyone here can be saved. Is God's grace sufficient for you to be saved? Yes or no? It is. Speaking of the same group of people, John says, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Oh, friend, I beg you to make it a priority to have a relationship with God. To seek a walk with God. A walk with God like Enoch had so that you'll walk right into heaven. Commune with God as if your life depends on it. Because it does. It really does. It's understand or perish. The year was 1988. Ivan Lester McGuire was an excellent parachutist that had over 800 jumps under his belt. He always wanted to join up with a team. And finally the opportunity came and he joined up with a team. Now Ivan's position of the team wasn't one of those who made the fancy maneuvers and the flips and all that. He wasn't the star jumper, but he had the most important decision. You see, Ivan was the team's videographer and photographer. And yes, they did have video in 1988. That is how the judges could judge the teams. Most of the things they did in the air couldn't be seen well from the ground, probably hardly any of them. And so it was important to have a, uh, someone to film that. Well, on that fateful day, the team climbed into the plane. And on their way up, Ivan reviewed all the necessary equipment and maneuvers. He thought of the timing of his jump, the angles he would need to get. At last, he was sure that everything was in place. It was his third jump of the day. One by one, the team jumped out of the plane and he waited the necessary amount of seconds. And then he jumped. If you watch the video footage on YouTube of his own jump, everything seems to be normal. He captures the other jumpers on film. And after that, you can see his hand come up and reach for his own chute. And it was at that moment, it dawned on him that he had forgotten to put on his parachute. Descending rapidly at 150 miles an hour, he screams frantically, Oh no! And then more resignedly, oh my God, no. He had done everything he could to ensure his team would win. Maybe he was distracted with the heavy and cumbersome equipment of the 1980s, I don't know. But he had forgotten the one thing that was essential to save his life. Could it be that we have forgotten the one thing essential to our own salvation? A deep, intimate, close connection with God. I'm not talking about something superficial. I'm talking about what Enoch had. A daily communion with God and a life that pleases God. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23, it says, We did all these things in your name, cast out demons in your name. But at the end, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Have we missed the one essential to our own salvation? Have we forgotten a walk with God? Ivan was prepared to do his job. He had all the cameras. He had all the equipment. But he didn't have what was necessary for his own salvation. We have all the doctrines. We have all the knowledge. But do we have a walk with God? The old song comes to mind. It's my prayer and I hope it's yours. Oh, let me walk with thee, my God as Enoch walked in days of old. Place thou my trembling hand in thine, and sweet communion with me hold. Even though the path I may not see, yet Jesus, let me walk with thee. If I may rest my hand in thine, I'll count the joys of earth but loss, and firmly, bravely journey on. I'll bear the banner of the cross. Tell Zion's glorious gates I see. Yet, Savior, let me walk with thee. I'm going to make an appeal. If it is your desire to have that walk with God, would you just stand to your feet where you are? By standing, you're saying, you know what? I want to have that walk with God. I want to 
be ready to be able to walk right on, on into heaven when he comes. By standing, you're making a decision that nothing, nothing is more important than you having that relationship with him. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we want that walk with you. We're here together, not as the pastor preaching, but all of us together asking us, Lord, to help us develop that relationship with you, that we may know you, though we may know you as a friend well known. Lord, it's my prayer that each one of us will be found faithful today when you, and not only today, but every day until you come, that we may know you. We may be glad to see you when you come again in the clouds of heaven. And it's my prayer, Lord, that not one person of this group and those watching and those listening, not one person will be missing. May each one of us be there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing. Our closing hymn is, Oh, Let Me Walk With Thee. And our song leaders will come forward and lead us out in that right now. testifies to these things says surely i am coming quickly amen even so come lord jesus may the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all amen <laughs>